Good morning. I'm Judge Marilyn Johnson, ret retired from the Circuit Court of Cook County and a member of the IJC, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee for this symposium to today's activities. We are delighted by your presence and your participation in this most important discussion. Trauma and bias as it affects our youth, particularly youth in the juvenile and criminal justice system. <clears throat> I proudly confess that my favorite social philosopher of the moment is Chris Rock, who to some does stand up comedy, but who to me does stand up truth. Nothing has been more true than Chris's recent observation on criminal justice when he said, you don't want to be a black man in any court. Even a black judge brings his lawyer to court just in case. And judges, our thinking is shaped in so many ways by who we are and what we have experienced. Even though judges more than many other people make a profound commitment to fairness and pledge not to operate on the basis of classification and differences in the people before them. But we've learned that because science has informed us that we often act in a manner contrary to those principles. Just what is implicit bias? The National Center for State Courts says it's the following. It is the bias in judgment and or behavior that results from subtle cognitive processes. For example, implicit attitudes and implicit stereotypes that often operate at a level below our consciousness and awareness and without intentional content. It is what lies below the surface that impacts our thought processes and our judgments. In February of 2016, the Washington Post reported in its business blo work blog on recent studies conducted around the country on implicit bias as it related to judges. For example, one study disclosed that white federal judges are four times more likely to dismiss race discrimination cases than their black counterparts. Conversely, white jurists were half as likely to uh, than African American jurists to find that discrimination had actually occurred. But we can't stop our analysis there. In the criminal justice context, a study conducted in the state of Louisiana quite surprisingly found that both black and white judges rendered harsher sentences to defendants of their own race. For example, when white judges sentenced white defendants, sentences were about 14% longer. Researchers surmise that among the factors that may have come into play in this result is some sense of overcompensation that may in fact relate to the actual race of the victim of the crime. We are all familiar with the more classic circumstance of implicit bias against defendants of color. Stated simply, implicit bias is a pernicious shorthand by which the real and important differences the judges should see and evaluate are obliterated by the shorthand of race, sex, and class. As a former sitting judge, I know that there is no disclaimer of fairness which can paper over this circumstance. We must recognize that the lens of bias exists, just as we must recognize that the people before us are more often than not victims of trauma caused by violence, caused by life circumstance, caused by disinvestment in their community, caused by shattered families and the like. So today's conference focuses on these two very important aspects of our justice system and importantly searches for strategies and solutions about how to overcome these issues. I want to call our plenary speakers forward this morning, if I can, Dr. Stolbach and Ms. Eidman.
And as Ms. Eidman comes forward, let me tell you a little bit about her. <clears throat> she is a senior supervising staff attorney at Public Counsel. And for those of you who may not know, Public Counsel is the largest uh, pro bono law firm in the nation. Um, and as part of the opportunity under Law Project, she uh, is involved with litigation to advance economic justice and civil rights. Um, she uh, is one of the lead counsel in the case of Peter P versus the Compton United School District, and I'm sure she's going to talk about that this morning. And um, this is a case which has excited many of us across the country. Ms. Eidman, prior to joining public counsel, worked for the law firm of Munger, Tillis, and Olson. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to her. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I am so pleased to be here today. And I really look forward to learning about some of the work that's being done here and um, sharing some of the work that we've done in California. Let me see if I can make this work. OK. Um, so as mentioned, Public Counsel is a legal services provider and a pro bono law firm. And much of the work that we do is impact litigation to advance civil rights and economic justice. So we've come at the issue of trauma and its impact on youth from the frame of an education equity lens. And in particular, we filed a number of civil rights lawsuits in order to advance education rights and bring the power of the court to bear on school districts that are perpetually disinvested in under-resourced and frankly, just lack the capacity to deliver decent educational opportunities to their students. Of course, these are the school districts to which youth of color and youth living in poverty are overwhelmingly disproportionately consigned. So as a pathway into the issue of trauma and its impact on youth from a civil litigation perspective, I wanted to talk about a case that we filed in Compton Unified School District um, arguing that under federal law, school districts have an obligation, an affirmative obligation, to provide accommodation and support to young people whose ability to learn is impacted by exposure to trauma. As part of our education ad um, advocacy in Compton, we spoke with parents and teachers and students and community members and heard again and again that the unaddressed impact of trauma on youth is one of the primary barriers to education um, in this education in the school community um, and in the community writ large. Again and again, we heard about the, the multiple overlapping and repeated adverse experiences affecting the young people in this community, exposure to violence, um, loss and grief, a dislocation of family members through incarceration, deportation, um, involvement in the child welfare system, extreme poverty, and the, the trauma of racism and discrimination. You know, I would talk to teachers, sorry, sorry about that. You know, I would talk to teachers and ask them, uh, what proportion of uh, the, the students uh, in your classroom do you think have experienced trauma? And they would say, do you mean this week, this month? Elementary school teachers told me that when they would go into their classrooms and say, how many of you, raise your hand if you've, if you've witnessed violence personally, every single hand would go up. And studies have made clear that young people in every community experience trauma. But in the communities that we serve, there are multiple overlapping um, prolonged types of trauma, not single incidents, what experts often call complex trauma. And at the same time, in the institutions that serve these communities, there are fewer resources to support and respond to, to the impact of this trauma on young people. So I wanted to start by sharing the experiences of one of our clients, Peter P. Peter P is not his real name. It's a pseudonym that he chose uh, actually for Peter Pan, the boy who wouldn't grow up. Peter grew up in Compton and as a very young child um, experienced significant physical and sexual abuse by stepfathers and caregivers living in his home. His mother suffered from substance abuse. 
Uh, he was put into the foster care system as a young child, shuffled in and out of that system from family to family. As he grew older, he witnessed and experienced other types of violence on multiple occasions. Multiple um, of his close family members were incarcerated, a brother and a caregiver. When he was in high school, he became homeless and not having any safe place to go, he lived on the roof of the school for two months. Uh, he had brought up old rugs and he huddled under them for warmth over the night, during the nights. And he brought, he secreted food away from the school cafeteria so that he would have something to eat. And when the school found out about this, instead of providing him resources and support, what they did instead was suspend him and threaten to refer him to law enforcement. So as you might imagine, Peter struggled with anger throughout his adolescence and childhood. He says that sometimes he feels like there's a demon inside of him. And as you also may not be surprised to hear, he's never received consistent mental health support or other support from the school or even the child welfare system that he's been a part of. Instead, he's been repeatedly suspended, involuntarily transferred from school to school, and it's had a devastating impact on his academic trajectory. You know, he's received A's and B's at times of relative stability, but uh, when things become unstable, he has you know, received all F's in every class, and indeed, he did not graduate on time with his class last year and is still not on track to graduate. Now, Peter's story, unfortunately, is not unique among Compton students, and I imagine it will sound familiar to many of you thinking about the, the clients and the populations that you serve as well. Com Compton serves a very high concentration of young people who have been exposed to trauma as a result of historical disinvestment in the community, housing discrimination, racial bias in policing, you know, Compton's homicide rate is five times the national average. The poverty rate is twice the national average. The uh, school district serves hundreds of students in the foster system, and over 10% of its students' population are homeless. And this high concentration of exposure to trauma has come with significant adverse educational effects. N numerous of the schools in that district have been persistently failing. One of the schools involved in the case, uh, Chavez Continuation School, has a proficiency rate of 0% in English language arts and 1% in mathematics. The dropout rate district-wide is 32%, and that is twice the number of students who graduate eligible to attend a four-year college in California. And despite this manifest need for support, in fact, what we find in the school district is fewer resources to respond to this incidence of trauma than in more affluent, whiter districts just across the way. So just to provide one example of that, when we filed the lawsuit, there were only 25, excuse me, 24 school psychologists and counselors in the entire district serving 25,000 students. While in Beverly Hills High School alone, with 1,800 students, there were nine counselors and a school psychologist, more than at all of the Compton High Schools combined. We know that unaddressed trauma has concrete effects on a young person's developing brain and ability to learn. And we also know that effectively foreclosing young people from educational opportunities has devastating consequences for their um, educational attainment, their uh, ability to attain economic self-sufficiency, and their life chances. And yet, the state of our systems, our educational systems and our other systems serving young people, have lagged far behind where the state of knowledge otherwise is. That's why what we really see as our touchstone in our advocacy around this issue is something that one of the experts uh, with whom we're working, uh, USC professor Marlene Wong, told me early on when we started working on this issue, which is that if you want to, to address the achievement gap, you have to start by addressing the impact of childhood trauma. So just to briefly talk about the lawsuit, we filed suit on behalf of Peter and Compton students like him against the Compton Unified School District, arguing that schools have an affirmative obligation to provide reasonable accommodation to students whose ability to learn is 
impacted by childhood trauma, meaningfully limiting their access to public education. Now, 50, Section 504 and the ADA are federal disability statutes, and what they require is that individuals who fall within the statutory definition of disability must have meaningful access to public benefits and services like public education. And disability is described, is defined very broadly and functionally. It's simply an individual with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Major life activities are then defined to include learning, reading, thinking, concentrating, and communicating, all of the core activities of learning and being in a school. Now, I understand legal advocacy. Uh, what we're trying to do is to bring the, devise creative legal strategies and bring the pressure of the legal system to bear as a catalyst for political, for, as a catalyst for change where the political process has been slow or too slow to respond. But we've drawn very, very heavily and see ourselves as supporting both the community movements and activists who have fought for these types of reforms and justice in their schools, as well as the brain scientists and social scientists um, and educators who have uh, developed the, the status of the information that we have about the impact of trauma on, on child development and learning. So um, I'm sure that Dr. Stolbach can talk about this much more eloquently than I can, and, so, and I'm sure that we'll develop a, a much deeper basis of knowledge about this in just a few moments. But, but in, in very brief, the, the medical science is conclusive that the impact of trauma on a child's developing brain is concrete and profound and affects the ability to learn in measurable ways. When um, a, a child who has been repeatedly exposed to trauma over a long period of time is confronted with a, a trigger, they respond in a series of predictable ways. For some children, this is a hyper-reactive um, response, leading to behavior that an untrained eye might see as out of proportion or out of context with the environment. So for example, a door slams and, and a child suddenly springs up and runs for the door or springs up and yells. Far too often in a traditional school, this behavior is labeled as aggressive or defiant or behavioral problems. And instead of supported, these children are penalized. They're suspended from school, they're expelled, they're channeled into the juvenile justice system. Um, when, they, when what they need is exactly the opposite, which is to de-escalate the, the situation and to be provided with support. By the same token, some children who have been exposed to trauma have the opposite response, which is to dissociate. And that might be um, a manifest by staring out the window or appearing detached, or a series of unexplained absences as children seek to avoid pos um, past sources of triggers. But in any case, this leads to two predictable patterns, which in both cases, when in all cases, excludes children from meaningful educational opportunities. Their, in, the response of the school physically excludes them from the classroom, but even when they are in the classroom, when in a dysregulated state, the, the cortex is essentially offline for the, the, ty the very types of activities that are necessary to meaningfully learn in the classroom. And social science has confirmed the, the, the detrimental impact of unaddressed trauma on the ability to learn. There have been studies that, shown, that have shown that children with repeated exposure to traumatic events are 2.5 times more likely to repeat a grade, four times more likely to experience academic failure, five times more likely to have severe attendance issues, and six times more likely to experience behavioral problems. The most critical thing is that the same social scientists and educators have developed really effective interventions to meaningfully address trauma um, and build on the natural resilience of children uh, to, to reverse these damaging effects and to really support kids. And these types of interventions have been shown to be successful in uh, school districts serving children with high concent school districts serving high concentrated areas of poverty, uh, like Compton and like I imagine many of the communities that you work in. Now, one core principle of, of 
all of these different types of interventions is that while individualized attention and support is important in many cases, it's not enough in schools serving um, and institutions serving high numbers of young people who have been exposed to trauma. What's really necessary is systemic change, whole school and whole district uh, models of trauma-sensitive and trauma-informed practices so that every level of the institution is sensitive to the impact of trauma on youth, um, its effects, and ways to respond to it. And while there are a number of different models that have been shown to be successful, there's a model um, pioneered by Chris Blodgett in Washington State, uh, the Hearts Pro Program, which has been in San Francisco, and it's actually the official legislative policy of the state of Massachusetts. There are certain core principles or components that are shared across all of these effective models. Uh, the first is that every adult in the system is a, a recipient of training. And that training is designed to educate uh, adults in the system as to what trauma is, how it affects all of us as people, and how to respond to common manifestations. So one really clear example is that um, last year, Peter told me that he was having a really tough day, and so he kind of put his head like down on his desk. And the teacher, thinking he was being funny, uh, came over to his desk and took a big stack of books and dropped the stack of books like that onto Peter's desk. And quite predictably, he jumped up and kind of took a swing. So again, quite particularly, quite predictably, he was removed from the classroom, sent to the principal's office, and ultimately expelled, excuse me, not expelled, uh, suspended for the rest of the week. And that's the type of incident and educational loss that could very easily be prevented by, um, by explaining uh, to teachers what trauma is, what common reactions are, and what productive ways to respond to these, to, to, to these types of scenarios are. Um, other components of this training include building, uh, affirmatively building skills to bolster resilience in young people, like social emotional learning, which has been shown to be um, to be effective in responding to trauma in classrooms, and uh, a program called PBIS, Positive Behavioral um, Intervention and Support, which helps teachers build safe and stable classrooms to uh, assist in learning. A second component of all of these models is the replacement of punitive discipline with restorative practices and restorative justice. So, you know, I see many people nodding, and as I, I'm sure, as many of you know, the traditional punitive disciplinary methods that many schools employ, uh, detention, suspension, expulsion, have been shown to be ineffective. The American Medical Association has made clear that, that these types of punitive discipline actually re-traumatize children, excludes them from the school, depriving them of the ability to learn, and they don't serve their purpose um, in the first place. Uh, not only that, but it channels young people into the juvenile and criminal justice systems. So in place of, of these traditional methods of discipline, effective schools uh, employing these models have replaced them with restorative practices, restorative justice models, which seek to, when confronted with conflicts, identify the source of the conflict, um, seek to heal and bring students back into the community. And then finally, for uh, the highest need students who do require one-on-one -on -one attention, all of these models also ensure that consistent high quality mental health support is available um, to support students. So briefly, where we are in this litigation is that we defeated a motion to dismiss in the first stage and received the first court order in the country saying that assuming all of the facts are true, schools do have an obligation under 504 and the ADA to accommodate students whose ability to learn is impacted by their exposure to trauma. On the basis of this initial victory, um, we've entered into collaborative discussions with settlement discussions with the district. We have a team of uh, top trauma experts from across the nation advising the school district and putting together um, a multi-year plan, both for a pilot period and then a scale up to a district-wide plan 
um, that would affect, that would address uh, the impact of trauma on Compton students uh, for years to come. And we're really excited about this, not just for um, our clients and the students in the school district, but because we really believe that it has a potential to serve as a national model for other schools confronting similar challenges who can look at sort of the core components of what a trauma-informed school system looks like and then adapt it based on their particular and local needs. And then very, very briefly, I just want to talk quickly about two cases that we filed in the last year because though we've gone on to um, address education equity from a few different perspectives in different communities across the country, something that we've learned from this work is that uh, accommodations and support for students impacted by trauma has to be a critical component of any remedy in an educational system. So we filed suit on behalf of um, students in Detroit, Michigan uh, last September uh, who have been essentially, effectively excluded from the educational system the, in, in the state of Michigan. Uh, in, in these schools in Detroit, uh, proficiency rates in English language arts are 0% in many cases. Uh, the conditions in schools are decrepit. There are no textbooks. There are classrooms without teachers. Uh, there, we found a seventh, excuse me, an eighth grade teacher, excuse me, an eighth grade student teaching seventh and eighth grade math in one Detroit middle school. Uh, ceilings are falling down. Rats and cockroaches are running across the floor. Students are subjected to such extreme temperatures that uh, they were fainting and passing out from the extreme heat in the first week of the school year. And so um, we filed suit under the federal constitution, and it's the first uh, lawsuit in the country to argue that under the federal equal protection clause and due process clause, um, students have a right of access to, lib to literacy to enable them to participate in the workplace and um, higher education and as full participants in democratic society. But a core component of the, the access to, lib to literacy that we're seeking is that students are learning ready um, by, uh, by ensuring that their health needs are met, their mental health needs are met, and that students who have been impacted in their ability to learn receive the trauma-sensitive supports that, that we are talking about in the context of the Peter P. litigation. And then this January, we filed suit on behalf of uh, Native American students in the Havasupai tribe, which resides at the base of the Grand Canyon. And this is a very, very different social and cultural context. Um, they, it's extremely rural, extremely isolated, in some ways as far away from the uh, dense urban school districts as um, you can get. And yet, what we're seeing are very similar patterns to the urban school districts in which we've worked. Students are not uh, being denied access to basic general education, no general education curriculum. They're only being instructed in English and math, not even receiving science, social studies, foreign language, arts, physical education. Um, there's no system of, of special education and um, no accommodation for the many young people in that community who have experienced very significant trauma. Instead, what we're seeing are young people who are excluded from the school uh, as a like directly as a result of the trauma that they've experienced. So students who, um, again, manifest trauma and act out in very uh, predictable ways are, instead of being allowed back into the school, placed on homebound schedules where they receive only a few hours of instruction per week um, and are being suspended on a nearly daily basis uh, and referred to federal law enforcement for childish behavior and behavior that's a direct manifestation of trauma. For example, one of the young people in the suit was uh, referred to federal law enforcement for prosecution for destruction of property for pulling the cord out of the back of a computer monitor when he was 10 years old. Um, so just if anybody wants a bit more information, both about the lawsuit itself, but also about the, um, the impact of trauma on learning, the medical science and the educational models, we have a, loss, a, a website set up, traumaandlearning.org, that includes a lot of the um, declarations and materials from the case. And feel free to seek me out. This is my contact information or come find me. And I can also give you more information about any of these topics or the other lawsuits as well.
thank you very much. And we'll take questions after uh, Dr. Stolbach. I'm sure there are many questions. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bradley Stolbach, who is the clinical director of Hurling, Hurt, Healing Hurt People, um, which is a trauma-informed hospital-based violence intervention model that is used in emergency pediatric settings here in Chicago. Prior to his uh, directorship at Healing Hurt People, Dr. Stolbach was for a number of years the head of the Laura Bita Children's Hospital Child Trauma Unit. In that regard, he testified in front of me a couple of times. Uh, Dr. Bradley Stolbach. Good morning. Um, it's really great to be here. I'm very happy to be here today and um, thrilled to be working with Catherine this morning. I'm only sad that I have to leave after this to go to a family uh, bar mitzvah um, because I'd much rather stay here and learn from everything that's going to be going on here all day. Um, so I um, am going to be talking about a lot of the same things that Catherine was just talking about, but from uh, a different silo, um, from a clinical silo. And um, I'm going to start um, by, there we go, right there. Um, talking about the work of John Rich, who is um, the director of the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice in Philadelphia at Drexel University, um, and who is, um, with his other directors at the center, um, the founder of Healing Hurt People, which is a hospital-based violence intervention program. Um, I'm not the direct clinical director of Healing Hurt People. I'm the clinical director of Healing Hurt People Chicago. Um, so we have our heroes in Philadelphia who have created this model and who help us to implement it. Um, but if you have not heard of John's work or, or read John's book, Wrong Place, Wrong Time, I highly recommend it. Um, John is an internist who got interested in patients who were showing up uh, with repeated violent injuries and he started to wonder what's up, you know, saw this person six months ago, they got stabbed and now here they are and they got shot. Um, and so he uh, decided to do some work and um, and what he identified in his work after talking to uh, many young people, young black men who um, had been injured violently is that a lot of the risk for violent injury is driven by trauma. It's driven by unresolved, unaddressed trauma. Um, so the cycle that he identified is that people are exposed to all sorts of trauma, some of that being violent injury, and they're walking around with acute stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or uh, more often, a diagnosis that's not in our book. We can talk about some of the reasons for that that relate to all the reasons for everything we're talking about today. Um, developmental trauma disorder. And um, in order to manage their environment and what they're dealing with day to day and to manage what's going on inside them, they often do things that are increasing their risk. For example, using substances to manage what's happening inside them or carrying a weapon because they think if they don't carry a weapon, uh, they're not safe. And both of these things actually increase the risk that they're going to be harmed. So then they may be injured, uh, <clears throat> re-injured, or may engage in retaliatory violence, um, which can lead one out of this cycle. Uh, the two ways that are most common would be getting locked up or getting dead. and um, if they don't get off the cycle there, then um, oftentimes they're injured. And our, the way we work in most systems is they go for their injury, their injury gets treated, 
there is no attention to any of the emotional, psychological, spiritual impact of what they've had to deal with, and they send them home. And so people are left to deal with and manage all of the responses and reactions that they have, which are normal to what they're dealing with on their own. And so the cycle keeps going and going and going. And you could take out injury and plug in whatever it is in your silo, right? You could plug in a felony conviction, or you could plug in uh, an expulsion from school, right? Um, all of our systems essentially do the same thing. We focus on the thing that brought them to our attention. We ignore everything else that explains why that happened. And then we send them out to deal with it on their own. And generally speaking, what we do increases the likelihood that more bad stuff will happen. So um, a lot of times when we talk about trauma, people think about PTSD. And, and PTSD is a simple thing. You can easily get a handle on it. It is some horrible thing happened, and then you have reactions and symptoms that are linked to that horrible thing. Um, the truth is, for many of our young people, there isn't one horrible thing. And the thing that we might identify as the horrible thing might not be the most important horrible thing to them. When a kid comes in and they've been shot, it's not most of the time the only thing like that that they've been through. Many times it's not the most important thing like that they've been through. It's just the last thing that they've been through. So uh, instead of focusing on individual events and how they affect people and injuries that we can directly link to them, we really need to be thinking in the way that Catherine is talking about, about how chronic exposure to trauma and violence in systems that are unable to provide protection, care, and comfort, whether those be attachment systems in the family or school systems or any system that we're in, um, how being in those systems and being exposed chronically to violence uh, shape who we are and what we do in the world. So the focus is on cumulative trauma and the developmental context in which it occurs rather than on discrete episodes of trauma. Many of our kids have had literally thousands of traumatic events in their lives. So when one uh, grows up in circumstances like that, it has a major effect on how one develops. And these are key developmental capacities that we acquire as we mature and as we grow. And uh, they are greatly shaped by our experience of safe attachment systems and safety or compromised attachment systems and danger. And those include the ability to model, modulate, tolerate, or recover from extreme affect states, uh, regulating our bodily functions, uh, knowing what's going on inside us, and being able to tell other people what it is that's going on inside us, our capacity to perceive threat, including reading of safety and danger cues, which is extremely important if you're in an environment such as this, uh, capacity for self-protection and self-soothing. This next one is so important uh, in the school context, but also in, in many other contexts that we deal with. The capacity to initiate or sustain goal-directed behavior. That is, to have a future goal, whether in five minutes or five years, and be able to plan actions to do in order to reach that goal and then initiate those actions. Um, one of the biggest problems that our young people are facing is simply a, a strongly held belief, which is rational, that they have no future. Um, 
Finally, the, co the coherent self or identity, is a, it's a developmental accomplishment. It's not something we come into the world with. A lot of times we deal with people as, this is a bad person who does bad stuff. Like that's their, we, we, we look at them, that's their personality. Well, it's not how it works. It develops over time who we are and who we believe ourselves to be. And then our capacity to regulate empathic arousal. That is, how do we manage it when we're aware that somebody else is feeling something? So if you think about all of these in the context of the work that you do, you can see how they directly relate to probably every single issue that you're trying to address in your work. Um, so this is just some data that shows that John was right and that uh, all that stuff I just talked about can lead to difficulties. Right, so this is some, some data. This is unscientific survey data from kids who've been locked up. And they're in a program called Changing Voices, which is part of Story Catcher's Theater. If you're not familiar with Story Catcher's Theater, which I hope you are, if you're from around here, uh, check them out. Um, so this is just among some of the kids in the pilot program for Changing Voices, what they reported about the, the traumatic stress that they'd been exposed to. The average age that they reported their first traumatic stress experience was four years and four months. And all of them experienced at least one form of ongoing traumatic stress with five of them reporting at least one that was present for their whole life. Um, and so they average, as a group, almost seven different types of traumatic stress by the time that they reach 18. And then this is their other adversities, right? So we talk a lot about adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs study, you probably heard about that. It's a lot of Chris's work is, is based around the ACE study. So this is all the other stuff they're dealing with besides those traumatic stressors, which for, for most of us, if we had just one of those, we would be a mess, right? Um, so they've got all these other types of adversity, um, almost five as a group by age 18 and almost six by the time they're 23. So combined, almost 13 different types of trauma and adversity that they've experienced. Um, with this group, I was able to ask them some questions about their own violence, their own involvement in violence. And those who reported that they had inflicted a violent injury on someone else had experienced, on average, 16 different types. Those who said they carried a gun for protection had experienced almost 17 different types. Two-thirds of them reported having a family member who's affiliated with a gang or street organization. Those who told me that they themselves were affiliated told me their ages of first affiliation were 9, 12, 14, and 16. So even when they're actually adults, right? Say they're 22 and they get caught for shooting somebody or something. If they first got into this when they were nine years old, 12 years old, how much sense does it make to look at them as adults who are uh, responsible for their behavior individually in the same way that we think of as adults who haven't had this kind of experience. Um, this is just some other data that uh, similar that Eddie Bocanegra collected with kids who were high risk or gang involved. And you, you know who Eddie Bocanegra is if you've seen the Interrupters, uh, YMCA Youth Safety Violence Prevention Program. Um, and he found exactly the same thing. Um, and this is one of the kids that, that it was in there, it's uh, Alfonso, we call him, he's 13 years old. He said, the hardest part about seeing my best friend die was watching him trying to breathe while he was turning blue and watching all of his blood run down onto the sofa. He's 13. Um, I didn't have anything like that happen to me when I was 13 in Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, this is uh, all the other stuff that, that he experienced. And that was the third homicide that he had witnessed. Um, so he's got 15 different types of traumatic stress and adversity that he's reporting. 
Um, this is the same information, but it shows it to you in where you can see visually what was going on at different times in his life. When, one, when he was dealing with one thing, what else was happening? Um, and this is sort of like the, the, the map in, in my head that I would like to have for every single kid that I work with, right? Um, not, to, not to reduce them to all the horrible stuff that's happened in their life, but to try to understand what they're doing and how they're surviving given all that horrible stuff. The black line on here is when uh, he first performed actions on behalf of a street organization. That's when he held a gun for his brother when he was eight years old. So uh, this is a definition of a child soldier that, that they use in the rest of the world. Uh, any person under 18 years of age who's part of any kind of regular or irregular armed force or armed group in any capacity, including but not limited to cooks, porters, messengers, and anyone accompanying such groups other than family members. Definition includes girls recruited for sexual purposes and for forced marriage. It does not therefore only refer to a child who is carrying or has carried arms. If our kids were in Colombia, they're child soldiers. Um, Christina Risen is an attorney who's done some really, I think, groundbreaking work around this, making the case that gang involvement, children's gang involvement is a form of labor trafficking. Um, and I'm not gonna go into that because you all have a lot more uh, expertise about that than me, but if you're not familiar with her work, I, I would say to check it out. So, what difference does it make anyway if we look at them as, as traumatized kids or we look at them as child soldiers or we look at them as criminals? Well, we, it makes a huge difference because the way we look at them, the lens we use to look at them, determines what we think the solution to the problem is. It actually defines what the problem is. And uh, we love to lock people up. We love to lock them up. And uh, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. So, who do we love to lock up, right? So uh, we're talking about violence at the individual level, but uh, we also have to think about the historical and societal context of that violence. And so we have to think about structural violence. And structural violence is a way of describing social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. The arrangements are structural because they're embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world. They are violent because they cause injury to people. Neither culture nor pure individual will is at fault. Rather, historically given and often economically driven, I would say always economically driven, processes and forces conspire to constrain individual agency. Structural violence is visited upon all those whose social status denies them access to the fruits of scientific and social progress. So urban black and brown families face a unique set of adversities and stressors. The massive historical traumas of attempted genocide and slavery have never been addressed, yet create the context in which present traumas occur and are dealt with. Um, those of us working with children and families whose daily existence is shaped by the legacy of slavery and racial injustice cannot optimally intervene if we fail to understand and address the effects of the trauma of the past. So who do we love to lock up the most? We love to lock up descendants of slaves and descendants of indigenous people, right? But we don't think about what we're doing in the context of who we are as a society. We think at individual level, what's wrong with this person and what do we need to do about it or to them? So why do I talk about this? I talk about it because it is the thing that we are not allowed to say, right? Like all trauma. And as long as we are not allowed to talk about it, as long as it remains taboo, uh, the racial divisions and disparities that pervade every aspect of our society will persist. So if we don't do something about the historical trauma that birthed our society, we are walking around as a traumatized society the same way 
individuals are traumatized by their individual histories. And what's controlling us is not what we think is controlling us. So, let me see what time it is. What do you think, five more minutes? Okay. So, uh, structural violence, we got plenty of that here in Chicago. Um, that was a map of 2015 shootings. This is just zooming in on the map a little bit. And that uh, white part over there, that's where we are, right? That's the University of Chicago Medical Center where I work. So why does it look like that, that part of the map? Why are we so safe in here? Money. money. Who's money? What money? Where's it going? University. University's money. What's the university spending its money on? I heard property, I heard security. The largest private police force in the United States. And their job is not to arrest people and get them charged with crimes, right? What is their job? Protect the property and the people, right, in that bubble. So, and I'm not saying that this is a horrible, like I'm glad, I'm glad that we don't have a whole bunch of shootings right here. Well, actually, my office is in Woodlawn, so. <laughs> but uh, it shows that if we want to make safe spaces for our young people, we have the resources, and if we deploy them the right way, we can create safety. So if we value the property and the people enough to make sure that they're protected, we can protect them, right? So it says something, thank you, it says something to us if we're in that group that gets protected, right? It also says something to us if we're not. So what messages are we sending to our young people? And as I said, it's completely rational for many of our young people to say there is no future for me. It doesn't actually matter what I do because there's nothing coming next. It's just now, which is how most adolescents are anyway, frankly. I mean, that's right. They're driven by their hormones, right? Or they want stuff, like nice stuff, cool stuff. It's normal. Uh, I don't have to talk about this, right? Y'all, I mean, th this place is a great, it's just a great example, Chicago, of all this stuff. It's, this stuff is not unique to Chicago, it's just that we have it so clearly delineated and, and I mean, the apartheid here is just, there it is. Don't talk about it, but there it is. And you know, for people who don't, didn't grow up in this, like I came from another place and I got here, I was like, what? What? Nobody told me it was like that, and then nobody says anything about it. We just act like it's normal. It's not no. It's, it's really, really weird, right? Except if you think about it in this context that I'm talking about. Um, one thing that's really hard, and, and, and I think everyone here probably struggles with this. When you're trying to do work that is in opposition to all of this, and you're working in systems that are, by their very definition, agents of structural violence, it's exhausting, it's depressing, it's demoralizing, right? So I, I work here, we had for 30 years no level one trauma care because it wasn't worth the money. That was the reason, that was the articulated reason. 
Now, we have an opportunity now. We have, I don't know, if you're not familiar with Selwyn Rogers, Dr. Selwyn Rogers, who came here to, to try to create this new 21st century level one trauma center for adults here, we have a tremendous opportunity and he's an amazing guy. And so please, if you're not familiar with him, check him out, Google him. You'll find all kinds of cool videos and stuff of him saying the best stuff you can think of. Uh, you know, I think I will play this. I know I'm taking a little bit longer, but this really goes to what you were talking about, Catherine. So I hope the sound will work. Raise your hand if, if, if you live in a community where uh, there's violence happening on a relatively frequent basis. Raise your hand if you know someone who's been injured by the violence going on in your community, been shot, stabbed, Raise your hand if you uh, know someone uh, or have a member of your family who's been killed by the violence going on in your community. Okay, thank you. Um, raise your hand if at some point in your childhood you were offered some kind of support or service to help you cope with that violence. Okay. I thought maybe one or two hands would go up. You know? Not one. We don't even talk about it, let alone give people support for it. We just wonder, why aren't you doing what you're supposed to do? Just forget about that. Just sit still, right? Wake up. So um, I think what I'm going to do is leave it there and just mention for a little happier kind of thing. One of the things we're doing, and this is one of those things where like the universe just did this and I happen to be involved in it like I, you know i'm very very lucky but this is a program called project fire fire stands for fearless initiative for recovery and empowerment and it's a glass blowing glass arts education it combines uh with mentoring trauma psychoeducation and employment and it's for healing hurt people chicago clients so young kids who've been injured by violence mostly shot um and particularly effective in working with students who've been exposed to traumatic experiences partially because of the risk that's involved in working with the material. It's, it's potentially dangerous for working with 2,000 degree molten material. It requires quite a level of trust to be able to work with the material. learn how to walk again, like, and try to run again, all that, that stuff, like, that was, like, the worst part. The bullet's still in my leg right now, like, I've been, like, kind of started to change my life around, like, ever since, like, a lot of people, I've been losing a lot of people and stuff like that. The last one I asked me to do that because they'll be like, you don't look like you blow glass or something like that, but I can show them better than I can tell them, like, People look at you different too, like, uh, he ain't just trying to be out here in these streets. He trying to really do something with his life and stuff like that. My end all goal for the students here is, is that they see other opportunities for themselves in, in any field, in any medium, in any way. They, they see a sense of future. Okay, hey, Elena, that looks good. What do you think? Yeah. That's a nice shape. So, um, I want to
point out one thing about this program that is maybe the most important thing, that everything you heard there was great, but the fact that they get paid $10.50 an hour for their four hours or eight hours a week, and that they say, I have a job, and they tell their homies, I'm going to work, may be the most important thing about this program of all. And so the hope is we started with four kids in the pilot, now we're up to 12. The hope is that, that we continue to be successful enough that we can create more jobs. If we give our kids jobs, I don't care how small the jobs, how uh, low the pay, which is, you know, unfortunately, it changes how they think about their possibilities. So, and it changes how other people look at them, like Dan Trell said. People look at me, they think, well, you don't, well, I can show them. So, anyway, I'll stop there, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. And, oh, there are some handouts out in the hall from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. So, if you grab, when you leave, there's a table out there, and there's a few that you might find of uh, interest. Thank you so much, Dr. Stolbach. If we can raise the lights, I'm sure many of you have questions and we'll be happy to take some of them now. Here comes our technical guru. Thanks. Questions? Okay. Yes, young man. My question is, how, how do we implement interventions for young people who are already incarcerated immediately after arrest? So, so how do we give them treatment for the trauma? And how do we, how do we determine what those plans are? Who, who can help us decide what those treatment plans look like so that we can show progress for young people to judges from you know the time they're arrested until uh, sentencing. Just getting some feedback from here, but. So the first thing would be, of course, to uh, completely change what we think the purpose is of locking them up, right? And to actually make it more like what we allege the purpose to be, right? Like why we created a juvenile justice system, right? Was to try to do something to help them so something would change. So the idea that we would make intervention that could actually help them available to them in juvenile justice, just as in schools, I mean, that's the first thing. We would have to decide that we actually want to do that, right? Um, so that's number one. <laughs> number two, uh, try to find somebody locked up with your client who doesn't have this kind of history, right? How many you think there are? But for 5%, what do you think? I mean, less than that. Yeah, so, so we don't really have to do anything to figure out who needs the intervention and what kind of intervention because everybody we lock up does. There might be in there a few really bad people who got caught and are just terrible, but that's not most, and most people like that don't get locked up, right? They get lots of money and, you know, public office and all this kind of stuff. So, so I think 
you know, we can put a lot of energy into screening and, 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 and assessing, and, but most of this is really just common sense, you know? So we, we need to have environments that are gonna support trauma recovery for everybody in them, no matter what their individual experience has been. And that's a lot of the work that Catherine is talking about. It's a lot of work Colleen Cicchetti has done here. So definitely one of your times today, go to hear Colleen. And, and then in juvenile justice, there's also a lot of work that's been done around this. And it's not so much which, which acronym or which little system you pick, right? It's if a system is determined to function in a way that promotes trauma recovery, then there are tools that they that they can use. So, yes, young lady with glasses. Hi, my name is Kelly Rostow. I am a postdoc clinician, and um, my degree is in clinical forensic psychology. So my colleagues and I, we graduated from a program that at the time was not accredited by the APA. My question is, how would you suggest we are able to get involved with university supported programs and public supported programs? Um, generally speaking, um, I mean, between the three of us, we've got, I'd say, I don't know, 12 years experience working in juvenile justice, working, I myself have worked in the state system, I've worked at Cook County Juvenile Probation and Outpatient, I've worked at Crane High School in the SOS Save Our School Children program, much with um, many of the same types of kids that you work with in the fire program, which is amazing, by the way. But we are barred from being able to get involved in a lot of areas because we are not APA, because at the time, the APA was not approving programs that were clinically forensic based. So all of the trauma expertise that we have, all of the things we have to offer these communities, how do you suggest we get involved? Because we are chomping at the bit to do so. I Honestly, I don't have a good answer to your question. Um, maybe she has some ideas. Um, I think the institutions uh, that issue the degrees would be the place to, to start. Um, and I know, you know, maybe there needs to be some more lawsuits. I mean, you know, what did you get? You're getting the two two schools that are going to do this? Two classroom? What is it? Two? So the pilot is going to start with two schools and then hopefully scale up, but, you know. Two schools. So, so uh, you know, it's a start. Everything's a start. So um, I just, I, there, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of advocacy to be done. The more that we are all working together and not at cross purposes and not competing for resources, the better. Michelle? Um, first of all, um, thank you very much. Uh, I commend you both on the work you're doing. I'm especially interested in the cases that have been filed. And from a community um, organizing standpoint of view, the, the question becomes, how is the community um, able to support the work that is going on and have a voice in the work that is going on? Uh, one, of the, the, one of our great gurus who will be here this afternoon, or uh, Shub and Cheryl Graves often say, um, nothing about me without me. And I'm thinking about the um, plans that are being put into place and wondering, is there room or has there been room made for the voices of those community members who are not um, part of agencies or part of, of clinicians or anything like that, they're grassroots community.
That is such a great question, and thank you so much for asking it. I mean, I think that all of us, you know, I, you know, Brad has mentioned several times, the need to step out of our silos and work collaboratively across all of the different groups and uh, perspectives that people are bringing to this. And when we um, entered into this, Pursuit. We did it alongside uh, community organizations working on the ground in Compton, an organization called Youth Justice Coalition, um, grassroots organization, student organizing organization, um, an organization called Futures Without Violence, working on violence prevention in Compton. So first of all, I think that before ever embarking um, on a, these types of lawsuits in a community, it's very important to do so in collaboration with alongside community activists and community groups. And in terms of the remedy, I, you have it precisely right. You know, there are these uh, models that different uh, academic institutions have developed and they've been successful, but it's not at all a one-size-fits-all approach. And every approach has to be tailored for the community and the context. And the people who know what the community and the context is best are the parents and students and the community groups who are active on the ground there. And that's why, um, in general, a, a critical component, I think, of any plan to create a multi-year um, holistic solution includes a listening tour uh, where key stakeholders from both the school itself, the official institutions, but also the community groups and interested community members can come and share as to what they think the key priorities are in responding to this challenge. Um, and also, we've been very, we're, we're you know, we're including that in our multi-year program and have been very fortunate that the groups that are active on the ground are very interested in contributing their work and their skills to, for example, run restorative justice programs and other types of community intervention in the schools. My name is Adair, and I'm an assistant public defender at 26 in California. Um, my question is, how are you dealing with the fact that as a society we still have trouble with mental health? We still think mental health is a sign of weakness, um, especially among males. And how has that impacted either of you and, and the work you're doing? I, I can start, and then I'll turn it over to Brad. I mean, this, this stigma around mental health is certainly a reason why um, it's it, one of the barriers or challenges to getting these practices adopted. Um, I think that the advantage of these system-wide, systemic approaches, whether in the educational system or the juvenile justice system or other institutions, are that um, these multi-tiered systemic approaches don't require screening and evaluation or uh, necessarily individualized attention where single uh, individuals are, are sing singled out for additional support or targeting. And um, ideally, if the trauma-informed systems work correctly, then these universal types of interventions begin to address the needs of individuals who are deeply affected by trauma and need additional support that are beneficial for, for all of us, regardless of, of the way that trauma has touched our lives. And at the same time, if the, the multi-tiered systems work appropriately, then um, individuals who would benefit from additional support can more easily be identified, not through a one-size-fits-all screening mechanism, but through an individualized approach where a, a caregiver, a caseworker, a teacher um, can identify and talk individually with, with, a, with a young person who, who might benefit from further mental health support. And I would add that um, the way most of our mental health uh, approaches are set up is that somebody has a problem and then they decide that they want help for that problem and then they have to seek out the help and then they have to somehow get through the door to the help. Um, and none of that makes any sense for most people and most of the things we're talking about because most of the people we're talking about actually don't have anything wrong with them. They're working exactly the way they were designed to work. Their bodies are doing exactly what their bodies are supposed to do. Their brains are doing exactly what their brains are supposed to do. Uh, so it's about providing support for dealing with the world you're in as opposed to fixing something that's wrong with you. 
And so, the, I mean, the, the, the trauma-informed care, one phrase to sum it all up is it's, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. Um, so a universal approach that presumes that stuff that's hard is hard for people and they ought to have some help, especially if they're little people, um, and they don't need to have something wrong with them. They don't need to do something wrong in order for us to say, oh, we better give you some help. We have time for one more question. Young lady in the black. Hi, my name, is, ooh, my name is Tracy Turner, and I am here with an organization, but I want to ask this question as a parent, uh, of, as a Chicagoan, and uh, of a mother of children who went through the Chicago system and experienced trauma. Um, my kids went to a very, a pretty decent school. They had support systems for trauma. However, it was directly toward the children and not towards the family. There were no supports. They would send notes home, okay, there was a trauma in the, in the area. We've got trauma specialists coming to the school. I had no idea what was going on. I have no idea how to help and support. And I would have to ask my kids and they would have to counsel me, which disempowers the parents. And so a lot of times when these programs are created, they're great and they're wonderful, but when they impact the family, it, it gets dysfunctional again. So are there, is there any conversation around how uh, the implementation will help and support the families? Because once you help the kid, they come back to that family. And it's just, it's, it's a boomerang effect. It may be effective and it may not. So as a parent, is there any comment for that? Yeah, absolutely. I think this field is relatively new, um, but, but parental involvement and parent education um, is, I, I think, a critical component of, of a lot of these models. And there's, there's sort of another move, this is again towards the siloing point, where I, I, as, as far as I know, it hasn't been integrated into trauma-informed schools as much, but there is um, a community schools movement across the country where the, um, the framework around uh, schools serving young people, particularly young people in low-income communities, um, is around providing support and wellness services, not just for the students, but for the families and the communities as a whole, for exact, precisely the reason that you've identified. You know, for the same reason that it's not effective to just take an individualized child approach, you know, from a school perspective, take the child out of the classroom, give him 30 minutes of counseling, and then send him back into the hallway where he's just gonna be re-traumatized again if you don't solve the root cause of the problem. Um, to take the child out of the family, you know, give the child supportive services, but not provide support um, to, to the family as a whole and the community as a whole is ultimately not going to address the root of the problem. So I think that for, from a practical perspective, schools are an institution where we um, intersect with a, a lot of children, and so they're a good delivery point for services, but they can't be the end, and to the extent that we can expand the scope of services and interventions provided to encompass the family and community, um, that's what has to be the goal long term. It's a, it's a great question, and unfortunately, in a lot of situations, it's exactly what you're describing, that your kids got something because somebody decided there need to be resources there for those kids, and there's no, like we forget that the kids actually have lives, uh, and lots of people they're connected to, most importantly, their <laughs> caregivers um, and their siblings. And so uh, what we try to do in Healing Hurt People is it's not just about the patient, it's the patient and the family. Um, and with our new program, which is uh, for patients and families, whether or not they've experienced an injury, um, it's the same thing. So the thing that gets you in the door is you've been affected by community violence. But the supports that we have in place are for anybody in the family. 
there are not enough resources, period, for any of this stuff. And that's, um, so there's also a tremendous amount of advocacy that needs to be done. And the, the, the smaller people are, the more sympathetic they are, and the more people go, oh, well, we really should do something. Um, but it, from an economic perspective, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, you, you could actually save a lot of money in your school system by uh, taking care of the families that you're supposedly serving in your school system, right? Um, a lot of resources get wasted on uh, lots of resources on a single problem, single incident, um, as opposed to more universal approaches. Well, this has certainly been an illuminating and, and fascinating session. And join me in thanking our presenters, Brad Stolbach and Catherine Eidman.